let's pray as we look at that part of God's word together. Father, thank you again that we can celebrate that Christ has risen from the grave. Thank you. We can look at that story again. We ask that you help us hear your word afresh this day. Help me speak what is true and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, of course, it is Easter time and we now live in the age of social media. So there's all these like uh, Christian jokes about Easter floating around. One that appeared on my feed uh, is, a, is a story about uh, Pontius Pilate and Joseph of Arimathea uh, having a conversation as they, I guess they may have done. Uh, and, and Pontius Pilate looks at Joseph and says to him, like, what are you doing, Joseph? You're the... You're one of the richest guys in the region. You're on the, on the ruling council. You have prominence. You have power. And you bought yourself this really lovely tomb that surely you were planning on being buried in and burying all your family members in. Why in the world did you let this, 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 this man who got crucified <laughs> use your tomb? That's madness. And Joseph Arimathea responded to, to, to Pilate saying, Don't worry. He's only using it for the weekend. <laughs> Now, of course, what we really know, besides the fact that this conversation clearly wouldn't have taken place, but, but, but there's no way that Joseph would have actually responded that way in, in, in the present tense or, or even in the future. I, there's no way he would have said that Jesus is only borrowing the tomb for a weekend somewhere between the, the burial and the resurrection. There's not a chance in the world that Joseph was thinking that this tomb was only going to be used for a couple of days. You see, at that time, Joseph of Arimathea was a Friday Christian. Uh, I'm going to try and reappropriate a term this morning. I hope it doesn't confuse everyone because we often speak about the problem of Sunday Christians, the idea of someone who, who only turns up at church on a Sunday, uh, but then basically doesn't live out their life for the rest of the week. I've said that analogy many times. You've all heard it in a million different sermons. I want you to try and pretend you don't know that and come into my kind of new categories of two types of Christians. I think there are Friday Christians and there are Sunday Christians. Friday Christians either consciously or subconsciously think of Jesus still being in the tomb. Either consciously they think that because they can't possibly believe that someone could actually rise from the dead. And so the only logical way of viewing Jesus is to think of him as a man who tragically died on that Friday and is still buried. He's an interesting fellow of history. He's someone you can learn from. He, he said some great things. He was kind and loving and all those interesting things. But he's just another figure from history that you can take or leave what he did or said. Subconsciously, I think many Christians, though, they, 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 they would say, no, no, we really do believe that Jesus rose from the grave. It's just by their very actions, they look as though they think Jesus isn't really alive, that Jesus didn't really rise from the grave, that Jesus did, won't really return, that Jesus isn't actually Lord of their life because they are still living just as they would have lived if they didn't really believe that Jesus rose from the grave. That's what I'm calling the Friday Christian. Whereas the Sunday Christian is the, is, is, is the follower of Jesus who truly believes that Jesus has risen from the grave, that he has ascended to the Father and that he will return one day, that he is the Lord that we must follow. And so their whole life is, is captured by Resurrection Sunday and wanting to live out its truth. And so this morning... As we nearly get to the end of our series in Luke's Gospel, we've got one more week to go after this. We're going to hear about the resurrection. Of course, it's Resurrection Sunday. I conveniently timed this several-year-long series to get to the resurrection today. Uh, somewhat manipulated things to get there. And so we're going to see, first of all, the story that we all know, the story of the empty tomb. And then we're going to hear about a sermon from a stranger and then we're going to consider if we are Friday or if we are Sunday Christians. So, the story jumps right in. And we know it well, don't we, that on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. The women definitely, at this point in time, are starting off the story as Friday Christians. They have no thought whatsoever 
that Jesus won't be there. The only thing that you find yourself questioning about the women is how in the world did they imagine they were going to get into the tomb? Uh, given that they had watched the burial, they'd seen that the big stone get rolled in front of it. We're not entirely certain what their game plan was, but they, I guess they went in faith that somehow they would be able to get in and show honour to the body of this loved one, of this one who they thought was amazing, this one that they thought was sent by God, but this one who is dead. But of course we're told, verse 2, that they found the stone rolled away from the tomb and when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. Understandably, they were somewhat confused. While they were wondering about this, we're told, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Uh, (laughs) It is this incredible moment where suddenly an angel appears that's how the other gospels record it it's just like remember the start of jesus life as as he is born and and suddenly the shepherds in the field and the angels appear all over to announce the news now at the other end the angels appear to announce the news that he is no longer there um but i'm distracted at this point so i'm gonna just get distracted and, and get that out of my system whenever i read this account i always find myself having a little giggle to myself it is a Let's be honest, it's a sexist giggle, but it's a giggle to myself because I'm imagining like Luke, Dr. Luke, uh, who we told at the start of the gospel, carefully investigated these things. He spoke to the eyewitnesses. And so you can imagine Luke sitting there with the women, with the Marys and with Joanna and whoever else was there and saying, all right, tell me what it was like. Tell me what happened when you, when you went into the tomb. What did you see? And they're like, there were these men there. And, and Luke, you're writing this down. Their clothes were gleaming like lightning. Rachel, you mentioned the clothes, Luke. The clothes. Who cares about the clothes? But the clothes get in every account because they want to make sure you know how they were dressed. Anyway, I've got that out of my system. I'll keep going. Lightning, gleaming lightning, dazzling clothing, these men. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Those words that have changed the history of the universe. He is not here. He has risen. And then they start telling them, Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then we're told the light bulb moment happens. And the women remembered Jesus' words. Of course, they then came back from the tomb. They told all told these things to the 11. Of course, Judas is no longer part of the 12, so it's now the 11. And to all the others, we're told there was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them, whatever the others were, that's other women who were there, who told this to the apostles. But the men, being men, basically decided the women were crazy. And so they did not believe the women. Because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Which, I guess to be fair, they've just come back from the tomb and said that Jesus is no longer there. He has risen from the grave. I can kind of understand why they were doubting. But Peter, we're told, Peter got up and he ran to the tomb and bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Peter sees the empty tomb, he sees the strips of linen, but all he moves from is doubting the women to just pondering what had happened. You see, at verse 12, I want to suggest that the women who started off as Friday Christians, they've moved to Sunday. They are believing the news, they are acting on the news, because the first thing they do is go and tell the news. They do exactly what every follower of Christ is meant to have done for the past 2,000 years. They believe the news of the gospel and they tell the news. The men, the men are thoroughly still in the Friday camp at this point. And then we hear about this rather interesting sermon from a stranger. Uh, Luke picks up the story. Luke's the only one that tells us this story. That the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Seven miles, what's that like? It's like 11 point something kilometres. Uh, frustratingly, we have no idea where Emmaus is. There's a few different theories, but we don't 
Definitely no, but given that Jerusalem's pretty much at the top of the hill, they were probably down somewhere, uh, 11 kilometres away. That's where they're headed. Anyway, these two were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Uh, again, the two, we don't necessarily know who the two are. Uh, in the next verse, we're told that one of them was called Cleopas. Cleopas. Uh, there are a couple of theories about Cleopas. Uh, one is that uh, it's just a typo, and he's the same person mentioned in John 19, uh, Clopas. Uh, we're told that uh, Clopas's wife was Mary's sister. In other words, Clopas was pretty much Jesus' uncle. Uh, so maybe it's Jesus' uncle, and I think the video, how it had a man and a woman, I think they're trying to like suggest that it was actually Clopper, you know, it was Jesus' uncle and auntie walking down the road. That's one theory, but of course, uh, they are different spelt words. It, uh, it's, it's a bit like saying, I don't know, like Catherine and Caitlin are the same person. Well, we know they're not, they're completely different, but they look very similar how they're spelt, or whatever similar words you want to come up with. Possibly, he's just a random guy. He at least gets named. The other disciple doesn't even get named. But two of them are walking down the road to Emmaus, and they're talking about everything that happened. The, the, the words used, it, it's not just like they're having a casual conversation. It's like they are having a very animated discussion. What has just happened? What have we just experienced over these past few years of, of seeing this man who did all those miracles, who, who could walk on water, who could turn... You know, water into wine, who could, who could feed thousands with just a few pieces of bread, who, who, who taught in this way that was just beyond belief, that we've never heard anyone else teach like that before, who had even risen a man from the dead. And now he's dead. And they're trying to get their heads around what it is they have experienced as they go on this journey away from Jerusalem to this town 11 kilometres down the road. And we're told that as they talked and as they walked, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognising him. That's the key point here, is that for whatever reason, they are kept from understanding that it is the risen Lord Jesus wandering down the road with them. And so Jesus asked them, I, I, we were chatting at um, our Bible study group the other night, but one of the things that's, that the Bible doesn't give us, it doesn't have emojis. So you don't know always what the tone is of everything that's said, but I imagine Jesus says this in a really cheeky voice. Like, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And these two stood still, their faces downcast. They are still mourning that this one they thought was the Messiah is dead. And they say, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there these, th 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 these days? And Jesus is like, what things? What's happened? I mean, I guess he could have said, I've kind of been, you know, buried the past few days. I may have missed something. And then, of course, they fill in the, the blanks. So they, the story, what, what, are, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth. Have you heard of Jesus of Nazareth? He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Maybe he was the prophet that Moses said was the one who was to come. Maybe he's the one that we've been expecting who would teach us all about God. Maybe he was the, the one. But unfortunately, the chief priests and the rulers, our rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. Didn't you hear the news of the man being crucified just a couple of days ago? Didn't you hear all the crowds chanting, crucify him, crucify him? We had hoped that he was the one. He was the one that was going to redeem Israel. He was the one that was going to kick out Pilate and his Roman overlords. He was the one that was going to establish this wonderful, eternal kingdom of Israel. We thought he was the one. And what's more, it's now day three since all this took place. And then in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb this morning. They didn't find the body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. You can only imagine how confused they are. It's a little bit cruel how Luke tells the story because we know it's Jesus walking along with them. We can kind of laugh at their expense, but you can just imagine 
the, 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 the trauma, really, that they've been through as they've seen their friend be crucified, this one they thought was the Messiah. And now they are completely lost and have no idea what they're meant to do. But we're told that Jesus moves from sort of maybe, if I'm speculating, maybe this sort of cheeky interaction with them to then preaching to them. How foolish you are! And how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And we're told, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them. It's, it's basically the way we get hermeneutics from. He interpreted the scriptures for them to tell them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Uh, I don't know about you, but I have all these, mo- I have all these sort of scenes in the Bible that I just... You, you wish there were the fly on the wall. I mean, there's no wall. But I, I wish somehow you could have seen what was going on. You had a, had a recording device there or whatever it might be. But can you imagine hearing this sermon given by the Word of God about the Word of God? Can you imagine Jesus, the Word, preaching the Word to these two random disciples walking away and explaining everything that is said about him? For 10 or 11 kilometres? It would have been the most captivating thing you can imagine. And frustratingly, we just get a sentence written about it. So Jesus had a couple of hours. I have a couple of minutes. But I, 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 here's my take on what I think Jesus would have said to say, this is how the Moses, this is how the prophets spoke about me, that the Messiah had to suffer. He, he probably started giving, he spoke about Moses. He probably spoke through the, through, the, through the first five books of the Bible. He may have started at the very beginning. That in the garden, after Adam and Eve and the sin, we have this, what's often called the, the, the first gospel, where, where we are told that even though the serpent, the serpent has deceived, but unfortunately for him, God is going to put enmity between the serpent and the woman and between her offspring, your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In other words, there's this hope that one day, one of the descendants of Eve, somewhere along the line, will be the one who will crush Satan, who will crush the serpent. And Jesus is saying, I am the one who has come to fulfil that. He probably spoke about Genesis 12, that, those promises to Abraham, that, that, that God would make him this great nation, would make his name great, that he would bless those who bless him, he would curse those who curse him, and all peoples on earth would be blessed through him. And at this point in time, all peoples on earth have not been blessed through him. Who, and, and Jesus is saying, I am the one that's going to bring the blessing to all peoples on earth. I am that one who's going to do that. He probably spoke the story of Abraham and Isaac of Genesis 22, where God tests Abraham to see if he would sacrifice his one and only son. And he says, that is pointing to the time when God would not ask someone else to do that, but he would sacrifice his own son for the sins of the world. That's what you just saw on Friday. He probably spoke of the Passover story from Exodus 12, and he spoke about the blood of the lamb that would, that would spare God's people. And he said, I am the ultimate Passover lamb. Jesus, the one who died two days ago, who you can't realise is standing next to you, is the one who is the great Passover lamb. He probably said, you're right that he was the prophet. Deuteronomy 18, when Moses says that God will send one after me, who is this ultimate prophet who will lead you in God's truth. I am that prophet. He would have spoken from 2 Samuel 7 and said, yes, when, when, when God promised David that one of his sons would have this eternal kingdom and we've been waiting so long because none of David's descendants are doing really anything at this time. I am the descendant of David. I am the one who will have this eternal kingdom. He would have spoken through the Psalms, especially the Psalms of lament. He would have spoken those words probably that he said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And shown how he was fulfilling that. And of course he would have spoken from Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant who was pierced for our transgressions. He would have reminded them of his own words. How many times did Jesus, when he was with you, tell you that he was going to suffer, that he was going to die? And on the third day, Corpus, you you just said it's the third day. Didn't something register for you that Jesus said again and again and again that on the third day he would rise from the grave? And they hear this 
And still, apparently, nothing happens. We're told that, that they finally arrive, they finish their journey, they get to the village they were going to, and Jesus continued on as if he was going further, a little bit cheeky again, I think. But they urge him strongly, stay with us. It's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So Jesus comes inside, and then when he's at the table with them, he took bread, he thanked, he, 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 he gave thanks, and he broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognised Jesus. And then suddenly he's gone. And they look at each other and they think, we're not our hearts burning when he just preached the greatest sermon ever preached, when he basically illuminated the scriptures for us. We're not our hearts burning. And then they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those of them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the toes too, they came along and said, this is what happened to us. We met Jesus, he explained the scriptures to us, but we didn't realise it until he broke the bread and then he's gone. And so these two, who, who, who started their journey on their way to Emmaus as definitely as Friday Christians, are transformed by the word of God who was among them, who was there with them. And now their response is to become Sunday Christians. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, which is madness, by the way, that they did that. We're told it was evening time. The whole reason they told Jesus to stay is because it's basically night time. They're 11 k's out of Jerusalem. And suddenly, in the middle of the night, without street lights, without anything like that, they leg it back to Jerusalem. They go through the danger because they have news to share, because Jesus is alive and they must tell others. They are Sunday Christians who have been transformed by the wonder of of God and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so then we have to consider what about us? Are we Friday Christians or are we Sunday Christians? You see, you might be here this morning because it is Resurrection Sunday because for many of us it's, it's, it's still this tradition that we come along to church at, at, at times of the year like Christmas, like Easter. But in all honesty, you're thinking, I can't seriously believe that a man was risen from the grave. I can't seriously believe in the miraculous elements of his life. They are too hard for me to comprehend. And yet I'm here because, well, I find Jesus interesting. He, he seems like someone who's, who, who's a, a great character. He said a lot of things that are worth listening to and Maybe I'll model some aspects of my life on them. I don't know. Uh, I like how Tim Keller sums up the importance of the resurrection. He's a, he was a, a pastor over in New York and written many books. If you've seen his books, it's worth reading them. And he says, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like Jesus' teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. So if you're here this morning and really not sure what you think about that, that is the question you have to grasp and grapple with. Can you believe in the resurrection? Because there's no point paying any attention whatsoever to Jesus if he's still in the tomb. Because he is just a fraud, if that's the case. Friends, I often speak about this, but people ask why it is that I am so convinced. Why would I want to have my, you know, my job, so to speak, to be about telling people about Jesus? And for me, it's because I'm absolutely convinced in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You see, it was just as hard for people to believe back then as it is now. We saw that in the story. The women had no idea what was going on. Peter, he sees the grave clothes and he's still confused. Those disciples were not expecting him to rise at all. Because dead people stay dead. And yet, they were transformed by this news. How does Peter go from being someone who, who a couple of days before that, basically left Jesus, denied knowing Jesus in Jesus' hour of need, who goes to the tomb, looks at it and feels confused by it, and then suddenly is the one 
who is leading the church, who is boldly speaking in front of crowds. Crowds, when he used to be scared of even the, the servants, he's now speaking boldly about Jesus to thousands of people. How does Peter end up at the point where, we don't read this in the Bible, but we read this from, from other sources, that Peter would be willing to be crucified for this Jesus. He was famously crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy of being crucified in the same manner of Jesus. How does he go from, 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 from chickening out to letting them hammer the nails in his hands if he knows that Jesus didn't really rise from the grave? But he saw the empty tomb and then he eventually would see the risen Lord Jesus and he was transformed by it. He was one of these people that was a Friday Christian that became a Sunday Christian because they actually saw the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And friends, can I encourage you that if that is you, then keep investigating and keep thinking and keep searching. But the news that you must grapple with is, did Jesus rise from the grave? And I think it is absolutely certain that he did. But maybe for many of us, though, we actually we do believe that. We're here because we believe that news. But the question is, are we actually transformed by that news? Uh, I've, I've, I've told this, this before, but there was that book written 30-odd years ago by this guy trying to rank... Who are the, the most important people to have lived in the, in the history of the world? Who are the people that have made the most influence on the world? That was his key criteria. And as the book was advertised, all the author was doing was considering everyone who's ever lived up until, you know, 1970 or 90, whatever it was, uh, and then trying to think who has had the most influence on the rest of the world. Where does Jesus come in on that list? It's number three. Number three on the list. Number two was Isaac Newton, uh, not who I named my son after, just quietly. Uh, and number one, of course, was the prophet Muhammad. Now, that shocks us that Jesus could not be the most influential person, given that, you know, we believe he was the creator of the world. Surely he should be the most influential one. But, and, and given that he has something like two billion followers, apparently, according to Google, how could he not be number one? And the answer, quite startlingly, is that it's because of us. You see, the author of this book wasn't really making a moral judgment about what he did or did not think about Jesus, but he's saying, who influenced his followers more? And what he was in effect saying is that if you look at the influence that Muhammad had over the, the, the lives of, 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 of Muslims and compared it to the influence that Jesus has over the lives of us, well, in his observation... Jesus doesn't actually make that much of an impact on our daily lives at all. Because for so many of us, even though we believe in the resurrection, we live as if Jesus is still in the tomb. As if Jesus has no bearing on how we ought to live, on what we ought to do and what we ought to say. Friends, what we must embrace on Resurrection Sunday is that Jesus has risen from the grave and that ought to transform us. Paul prays for the Ephesians I was about to finish up. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. He wants us to know the hope that we have, the hope of the riches of this glorious inheritance that we receive because of the resurrection. And he wants us to know the power that is at work within us. What's the power? That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave is the power that he has given us who trust in him. He has given us his spirit. <laughs> the spirit that rose Christ from the grave is now at work within us. And so we ought to be people who move from Friday to Sunday and allow this spirit to transform us in all we do, to live with confidence in the resurrection, to live with assurance of the inheritance, the riches that are promised to us who believe, and to make every decision in life through this new lens that we believe that Jesus is risen from the grave, we believe that he is risen to glory, we believe he will return, and we believe that he has given us the sure and certain hope of the life to come, of something far better than we could ever imagine. And he has given us 
this mighty strength to live his way. And so Resurrection Sunday should be this day that we remember that Jesus has conquered death, that sin has been defeated, that the tomb really was empty, that Jesus really has risen, and the same power that enabled him to rise from the grave is now at work within us. And so we live each day now as Sunday Christians who know every day of our life is lived through the lens that Jesus has risen. And that changes everything we do. What a wonderful, wonderful day Resurrection Sunday is. Hallelujah. Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the amazing hope that we have that Jesus has risen from the grave. We thank you for this power that is at work within us. And we ask that you would enable the eyes of our hearts to be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which you have called us. That we may know the riches of this glorious inheritance that we have and this incomparably great power at work within us. This power that is the strength that raised Christ from the grave and seated him in the heavenly realms. Help us know each day this power. Help us know each day the hope of the resurrection. Help us know each day the certainty of the inheritance that is to come. And live for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.